Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 81 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Coombs, and today it's just me on the show. I'm getting quite sentimental today because season two is almost over. I can't believe it. (laughs) I hope you guys have really enjoyed season two on the Healthy Gut podcast. It is your opportunity now to tell me what you would like me to cover in season three. So things like Who would you like me to interview? Are there topics you would like me to cover? Anything and everything in between. This is the podcast for you. I absolutely love hearing feedback from all of you. And I want this podcast to be a podcast that is really helpful and informative and supportive of your SIBO journey. Now, I have a pretty good sense of what you want, but I'm not exactly certain on some of these things. And that is why I've got a quick survey that I would absolutely love for you to fill in for me. It literally only takes a couple of minutes and it means then that you get to help shape the future of the Healthy Gut podcast. Podcast, which is super exciting to know that you get a say into one of your favorite podcasts. So, to do the survey, just head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast. There's a pop up that appears on the screen that invites you to take the survey. It's absolutely free to do, it's confidential, and your feedback is so important and vital for me as I go into preparation mode for season three. Now, as we come to the end of the year, the holiday season can be incredibly overwhelming for us. We've got Thanksgiving coming up shortly, and then Christmas and various other festive holidays that occur, not to mention all of the socialising that generally comes with the holiday season. It can feel completely and utterly overwhelming when you're in the midst of dealing with SIBO and then you have to deal with the holidays. It can make you feel like you want to just hibernate, disappear from the world for a while. And I promise you, you do not need to do that. You can have a really happy, fun, delicious holiday season. And that's why I've developed the Getting Ready for the Holidays SIBO Coaching Program. It's there to support you through this period, to give you access to all of my handy hints and tips, and also to be going through this period with other people with SIBO who are just like you. You can enroll today and get access to the program But as a special bonus and a thanks as being one of my favorite podcast listeners, I'm also giving you a special bonus where you get access to all four of my cookbooks and my two monthly meal plans absolutely for free. So that's a value of $135 that you get for free by just signing up to the Getting Ready for the Holidays SIBO Coaching Program. But this offer doesn't last forever. It does end on Sunday, the 11th of November. So guys, if you feel that you are you really need that extra support over the holiday season, I would love to be there supporting you through it. And why not do it now when you can get all of my cookbooks and meal plans absolutely for free? So head to thehealthygut.com where you can see information about my group coaching program and you can sign up today. As season two comes to an end, I'm feeling really reflective of my own journey with SIBO. And I really want to share with you what I have learned because I have learned so much, not only about SIBO, but about myself, about my body, about the digestive system and just health in general. And I want to share my insights with you. I'm quite a way along the journey with SIBO and I acknowledge and recognize that 
what I've experienced, some of you are yet to get to. And so by hearing some of my insights and my learnings over the last couple of years, it might help you feel that there is hope, there is light at the end of the tunnel and that you too can start to feel better soon. Just as a reminder, I was sick pretty much my whole life. I was born two months premature. I was reacting to dairy straight away. I didn't do great on formula. My mum wasn't able to breastfeed me and I got every illness under the sun as a kid. I've had tummy troubles my whole life. I remember feeling sick as a kid and saying I just didn't feel good but I never knew why I didn't feel good. So it really was no surprise then that I ended up with SIBO and a host of other conditions and when I got my SIBO diagnosis I was feeling absolutely rotten. I felt so miserable with life and I was really questioning whether this is the life I wanted to live. So one of the first learnings that I have taken out of my SIBO experience is that SIBO is a massive wake-up call. Our body is giving us such a clear signal that it does not want to keep living like we have been. And this can be really hard to get your head around because we just want life to go back to the way it was. But how can we expect to achieve health if we keep doing the things we've always done? How can we then change? And this can take some time to get your head around. Really, truly identifying what it is in your life. And often there's multiple things that need to change in order for you to start regaining your health. When I was first diagnosed with SIBO, my whole thought process was around getting an all clear permanent SIBO resolution, the fastest, the quickest and the best because I am a type A personality. And I realized over time that this is not necessarily possible for me and it's not necessarily possible for everybody. And that's okay. We know through the likes of Dr. Alison Seebecker that about two thirds of SIBO patients relapse. And I was adamant that I would not be that person. And then I was that person. And initially it was really hard for me to reconcile the fact that I had relapsed with SIBO. And I get messages from people who say, I can't believe you've relapsed. If you've relapsed, what hope do I have? And here's the thing, guys, relapse isn't a bad thing. I'm not scared of relapse today like I was a couple of years ago because all it's saying to me is I haven't achieved what I need to achieve yet. It doesn't mean I won't. It just means I haven't got there yet. And I also realized that I needed to keep looking into my body as to why my small intestine was not working correctly and it allowed the bacteria to overgrow. SIBO in and of itself isn't a diagnosis. It's just a symptom of one thing or multiple things that are going wrong in our body. And it's our job with our practitioners to play private investigator to uncover what's going wrong. Now, type A personalities like me want to know what's going wrong immediately. We want to know everything all at once. And another realization I've had is that this is like peeling back the layers of an onion and it can take time. And that can be challenging if you're someone like me and you want to get everything sorted in one go, know everything there ever was to know about everything there ever is to know. (laughs) And so it can be a challenge, but I think that this is done in a way that the universe is saying, hey, just slow down. You've been sick a long time, so it's going to take some time to get better. We can expect that once we get this SIBO diagnosis, that we will have complete resolution within days, weeks, months at a stretch. I know when my naturopath told me to expect a minimum of three months of treatment, I was like, are you kidding me? Three months? You're telling me it's going to take me three months to get better? And what I've realized now is three months was just a drop in the ocean. That is no time at all. I had been sick my entire life. I was 36 years old when I discovered I had SIBO. It's 36 years of life of my system being compromised. Why did I expect 
everything to be resolved within three months or less. That was crazy. So one of my lessons over this process is that it takes time for the body to heal, but given the opportunity, the body will heal. We just need to give it that opportunity. And if all we're doing is worrying and stressing about the fact that we haven't got complete resolution today when we only started treatment yesterday, then we're not putting our body into a comfortable state to allow healing. We can also get really fixated that 100% resolution is our goal, but this might not be possible, guys. We might only get to, say, 75% resolution or 80% resolution, but that's okay. If you felt 75% better than you do today, don't you think that would still be a really great outcome? I know I am significantly improved from where I was. Yet, I'm going to be one of those relapsing cases of SIBO. And even when I did relapse for the first time with my SIBO, I still felt better than the first time I knew I had it. So for me, knowing that I will have a vast improvement from where I was, but I might not ever get to this magical 100% improvement and that's okay. I'm still living a much better life today than I was previously, even though I have relapsing SIBO. It's also important for us to focus on how we're feeling rather than what the test results say. I think testing is incredibly helpful for the diagnosis of what's going on in our body. And sometimes we need to do multiple tests to rule things out. And this is something I hear from people quite often where they go and have tests like an endoscopy or a colonoscopy and they come back clear and people say, but that's not fair. I wanted them to find something. But if we get an all clear test result, what that does is it helps fine tune the search. And let's not wish worse things upon ourselves. Let's not wish an inflammatory bowel disease upon ourselves when we've just got SIBO. So don't go looking for uh, test results just so that you can say you had something show up on a test result. A negative test result can still be really, really useful in in the diagnosis of what's going on. I know I wanted to get the holy grail of the all clear SIBO breath test. When I first got diagnosed with SIBO, that was I was totally fixated on it. But getting a SIBO all clear test result might not be part of your picture. For you, it might be about managing your SIBO rather than completely eliminating it until you're able to address the underlying causes of what's going on to allow this bacteria to overgrow. And you may be one of those people where the complete resolution of the underlying cause or causes isn't possible. So only focusing on a clear SIBO breath test can set you up for failure. Instead, let's focus on how we're feeling. And that's where using something like my food and mood diary can be really helpful to track your symptoms or journaling. How are you feeling today? It can be really difficult for us to remember how we're feeling today versus how we felt four months ago if we don't write it down. So I really encourage you to write down how you're going. And it's small incremental changes that we're looking for. So for me, it was around going to the toilet. So, you know, I went from going to the toilet once or twice a week to then starting to go every few days, then every second day and then every day. So those changes took some time to appear, but there was a really clear progress with how I was going. Now, I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't have started documenting it. So documenting on the small incremental changes that you're going through can really help you to see the improvement that your body is making. When I was first diagnosed with SIBO, I was approaching my health with fear and hatred. I'd been sick such a long time. I was terrified I was going to end up with cancer. I hated the fact that I was so sick. I was full of anger over it. I felt really hard done by. Why me? Why was I the person that was born premature? When my sister was 
born full term, in fact overdue, uh, she never got sick like I got. And it was really frustrating that I was the one that always got everything that was going around and I always got it the worst out of everybody. And I really had to change that internal conversation with myself. Instead of approaching it from such a negative stance point, I've started to approach it with interest and compassion and intrigue. I now see myself as this amazing science experiment of one. And I have learned so much about the human body. It's like doing biology at school, but so much better. And I loved biology at school. So when something happens to me now, instead of going, oh, God, I knew that that was going to happen. I'm so angry with the world and my stupid body and my stupid condition. I now say, wow, that's so interesting. What can we do about it? A recent example of this is around the control and management of my hemochromatosis. And this is a condition that's genetic. It's switched on with me as my gut health got worse. And my body thinks that I'm not absorbing enough iron. So it's absorbing way too much iron. And I can now see a correlation between SIBO being present and my hemochromatosis flaring. And recently I did the elemental diet and when I commenced that, my hemochromatosis and my iron saturation and ferritin levels were at an all-time high and they were getting pretty bad. My doctor was quite concerned at how high they were. I had a suspicion that the elemental diet would help control not only my SIBO but my inflammation and help heal the lining of my gut. And I was so interested to see what my blood test results would show once I had completed the elemental diet. Now, I do have a full review of my elemental diet to share with you guys. I'm waiting on my SIBO breath test results and I really look forward to doing that. So make sure you are a member of the Healthy Gut YouTube channel where I will be sharing that. Uh, But A little sneak peek of some of those uh, results is that we were able to directly uh, look at the positive impact that healing my gut and reducing my SIBO, which I suspect I've reduced my SIBO, we're waiting to see those test results, uh, but that that had on my hemochromatosis. So I'm now so interested and excited about how I can have such a strong impact on my health and other conditions when I'm focusing on my gut health and my SIBO. I could have been really angry and fearful about that. Instead, I'm interested, I've got compassion around my body and I'm just so intrigued at the wonders of the human body. Another lesson that I have learnt over this process is that diet isn't everything. In the sense that if you're following a SIBO diet, That's not the only thing you need to do to treat your SIBO. When I first got diagnosed with SIBO and I was told to follow the SIBO biphasic diet, I was zealous about it, obsessive, controlling, OTT. I was really intense about the diet because it was one thing I could control. But what I have learned over this time is that, yes, diet can be incredibly useful to support our body when we're in a flare. It can really help to control symptoms, but it isn't the panacea. It isn't everything when it comes to SIBO treatment. It is just one spoke in the wheel. And guys, if you can eat something and it's not on one of the SIBO diet lists, but you don't have any symptoms... Well, that's fine. You're not going to bring your SIBO back just because you ate something that isn't on a list. And likewise, if you do eat something and you've had a reaction, then that's okay too. Because these diet protocols are really useful guides, but every single person is unique. We need to find a nutritional way of eating that supports our unique microbiome. What works for me won't work for you. And that can be really challenging to get your head around because in the early days, you just want to be told what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And you don't want to have to try and figure it out on your own. 
But it's really fun learning to love food again. Food isn't the enemy, guys. Yeah, it can make us feel pretty rotten at times, but it's not the enemy. Food is our life force. And what I get so sad at seeing is how many people have become so restricted in what they're eating that they're literally eating five foods. If we restrict our diet right down to next to nothing, we are setting ourselves up for long-term failure and a lot of pain and heartache. So I wish I'd known this earlier in my journey because I was very obsessive about my food, very restricted in my food. Now I'm not like that. Now I approach my food with interest and intrigue and compassion and excitement. Remember those things that I was just talking about? So I can still have a reaction to food and I now say, wow, that was really interesting. Thank you, body, for giving me that symptom. I'm going to mark that down. I'm going to journal that and I'm going to come back to you. I'm obviously not ready for that just yet, but I'm excited to test that again in the future. If you're finding that you are super restricted with what you're eating, I can't implore enough how useful investing in the support of an experienced dietitian or nutritionist can be to help you get out of that cycle. Somebody that is experienced with SIBO, who understands the complexities of this condition and can help build a nutritional program specific for you where they can do some additional testing, they can see where your sensitivities lay and they can help walk you through so that you are eating as diverse a range of foods as you can tolerate today. Another thing I've learned over these couple of years is what you can tolerate today isn't what you can tolerate tomorrow. Our microbiome is constantly changing and evolving and therefore our ability to process and digest certain foods changes. So just because you can't eat something today doesn't mean you won't ever be able to eat it again. And it's also really important that we start small. And I didn't know this when I first started trying to reintroduce foods. I'd just have huge quantities of them and then be like, oh, I can't eat lentils because I just blow up with gas when I eat them. It's totally fine to start with a teaspoon or a half a teaspoon or a quarter of a teaspoon of something and slowly build out from there. If you haven't eaten something for a long time, Don't expect your body to know what to do with it immediately the first time you give it to it. And just because you have a symptom to a new food doesn't mean your SIBO has come back. A quarter teaspoon of something isn't going to immediately put you right back at the start with your SIBO. It might just be that your gut's got to learn how to process that food once again. Tracking and journaling how you go with your food reintroduction is really important because it can help show the progress you're making. And a food that I talk about quite often that took me some time to get back into my diet was pumpkin. I love pumpkin. I love roasted pumpkin. I love pumpkin soup. I love pureed pumpkin. I just love it. And when I was on my SIBO diet, I could not tolerate it, even just a mouthful, and I would just blow up. I would be so bloated and uncomfortable from it. And yet this was considered a totally fine food on so many of the SIBO um, diet protocols. But I really wanted it in my diet. And so what I did was every month I would test it again and I would have an experience with it. I'd often bloat from it. It took me six months to get pumpkin back in. I tell you what, the day that I ate it and nothing happened, I was so excited. I also think it's really important that when it comes to food reintroduction, we think about the foods that we love. Start with foods that you're really looking forward to eating again. Now, guys, when I talk about foods you're looking forward to eating, I'm not talking about going out and eating a a burger from McDonald's. I'm talking about whole, real foods. Let's fill our bodies with really good nutrition rather than crap, franken food, disgusting, plastic, chemical laden, awful non food. 
Let's focus on real food that our body knows what to do with. But think about the plethora of amazing foods that are natural that we can choose from and go with the ones you feel most drawn to. I'm a really big believer, and I'll talk about this in a minute, about our intuition. Our body tells us so much if we choose to listen. So go with what you're feeling. I've got loads more just like this coming up after this break. We'll be back in a moment. When it comes to our nutrition, I do want to talk about the benefit of working with a skilled psychologist in addition to a nutritionist or a dietitian if we feel that our approach to food has become problematic or disordered. And this is what I've done with myself. I realised after doing an episode on the Healthy Gut podcast around disordered eating with the lovely Diane. And I I was like, oh my gosh, that's me. I'm so disordered in my approach to food. And so I'm seeing this so frequently. It absolutely breaks my heart and it, I'm absolutely passionate about helping others to not get where I got with food. Investing in a psychologist who has the skills around disordered eating can be such a great use of your time and your finances because getting out of really disordered eating is so much harder than being able to recognize that things aren't going great for you and doing something about it sooner rather than later. I've also learned over this journey that there are four stages to our SIBO treatment, yet we often only stay in the first two. So stage one or step one is the diagnosis. And sometimes this is not done very well. Sometimes we need more testing to really uncover what's going on in our bodies to know how we need to treat them. And quite often there is more at play than just SIBO. The second step is treatment. Treatment of SIBO, treatment of other conditions that are at play in our body. And we might need to prioritise our treatment from a financial perspective, an emotional perspective, a practicality perspective, and also looking at what's more important. Where do you need to start first? The third step is prevention. So we've completed the treatment, but what do we need to do to prevent the SIBO relapse from occurring? And guys, I completely failed at this. I went through diagnosis, I went through treatment, and then I stopped the first time round. So no wonder my SIBO came back. Because I was just like, I'm done, I got the all clear breath test, life's amazing. And yeah, I had a couple of good years, and then it came back. So prevention is really important. And this is where things like a prokinetic support can be incredibly beneficial to so many SIBOers where we're supporting the motility of the small intestine to keep working even though the SIBO is no longer there. And the fourth step is maintenance. What do you need to do for your body to keep it in a healthy state? For myself, I'm really now excited and interested and intrigued around the prevention and maintenance phases for myself now that I know that that's what I should be focusing on. I'm awesome at diagnosis and treatment. I haven't been awesome at prevention and maintenance. So I really look forward to sharing with you over the coming years what my prevention and maintenance program looks like for myself. I've also learned that we need to take a, a full 360 degree view to our health and not just focus on taking drugs and modifying our diet to fix this. So what do I mean about a 360 degree view? So I look at my sleep. Sleep is so important for restoring 
broken cells, damaged cells for healing, for repair. If you are only getting five or six hours sleep a night, how can you expect your body to repair itself? I've talked a lot about how I'm a natural night owl. I naturally will veer towards staying up really late. But I've put a priority on my sleep because I've recognized that if I continued to get poor sleep, not enough sleep, getting to bed way too late, getting up early, feeling exhausted every day, that I was not setting myself up for success. Remember what I said at the start, if we always do what we've always done, how can we expect change? Well, if I always slept like I've always slept, how could I expect my body to heal? Stress is another massive point. And I myself have purposely at times put myself under enormous stress. I see amongst the SIBO community that stress is a major factor. Some people love being stressed. I used to. I used to think I thrived on stress. I've recognized that stress was keeping me sick. I now am really protective around myself and stress. I do not want to put myself under undue stress. And so I've cut out people from my life. I've completely changed my career so that I can reduce my stress and improve my health. And that leads me into relationships. I realized that so many relationships in my life were causing stress. You know, I've had some pretty nasty bosses over the years that caused me extreme stress. You know, the kind of stress where you feel sick at the thought of going to work. You've got heart palpitations from just being so overwhelmed by the negativity of these people. But it doesn't need to be that extreme. You can have people that are passively aggressive who cause you this low level stress. So have a really good look at who's in your life. What relationships can you change? What you might you need to just manage? But even just through the identification of relationships and stress, that can reduce the stress because you're like, oh, okay, yep, I totally see this now for what it is. Community has been part of my 360 degree view to health. Feeling like I am part of something and that I am not alone has been enormous to my recovery. It's been enormous for my members of the SIBO coaching program. Something that they commonly say to me is, oh, now that I'm part of the SIBO coaching program, I don't feel so alone and isolated. I feel like I'm part of a family. I even had one of my members travel to Australia for vacation because of the friendships she had made through my coaching program because the community of people that she is now she can now call friends because of the program that she's done with me. That's incredibly powerful to feel like you have people that get you. But what I will say around community is that we need to approach community and positive community rather than negative community. There are some great online platforms out there where there's plenty of SIBO people, but they can be so overwhelming and negative. People are really quick to share the bad things and they're not so quick to share the good things. I purposely tune out of a lot of those groups because I'm very sensitive to it. I get, I'm so compassionate around other people's health and well-being and I don't want people feeling sick that when I read post after post after post of just extreme negativity I take it on board so I tune out of those groups and I just dip in and out occasionally movement is another really important part to our health if we're not moving our body appropriately for our health today we can be doing so much damage to it Now, that might be that you're not moving enough, you're too sedentary, and the digestive system really can benefit from moving your body. But likewise, if you're a type A personality like me, you're probably out there smashing it when it comes to your exercise because you feel that you need to do the most intense, the highest intensity, the greatest. (laughs) And that can be really stressful and too much for your body. 
don't be like me. Don't go and train for triathlons thinking that that's the best way to get healthy and then have to come home and sleep for hours because you've just exhausted and depleted your body. So move your body appropriately. For me, that's been changing from doing triathlons to doing walking and yoga. I used to say things like, I hate yoga because it's so boring. I I want to sweat. I want to be puffed. I want to feel like I've worked, but it wasn't good for my body. Yoga is so much better. Walking with my little doggy is so much better for my body today. One day in the future, I'll get back to triathlons or I'll do something else. Our nutrition is really important, but like I said, it's not the, the be all and end all. And the one thing I've learned is food is not the enemy and there is not one size fits all diet. We can use the SIBO diets that are out there as guidelines, but we need to modify them for our own personal nutritional requirements. And we have this great opportunity to learn what foods our body needs today and what it will need in the future. Another key component to recovering is our mindset. Now, I'm not all about, oh, we must just stay positive all the time because that's not reality. I now understand that feeling sad, feeling sense of loss, feeling fear and depression, being fatigued are totally natural psychological elements to a chronic condition. And it is absolutely okay to feel this way. But the key is that we don't stay here. And if we find ourselves staying here, this is when we really should go and seek some support. But we do need the yin and the yang. We do need the darkness and the light. We can't just be happy, happy, happy all the time because that's not natural. But I really encourage you to do what you need to do to not only experience the downsides, but to ensure you're supporting your mindset to to experience the positives as well. Our environment also plays a really big part of returning to health. And guys, I really encourage you to go and listen to the podcast Hidden Brain and they've got a fantastic episode called Our Better Nature which aired on 11th of September 2018 and it talks about research into health and crime and all sorts of things that humans experience when we live in a concrete jungle versus when we get out into nature. I often talk about the benefit of getting outside, getting fresh air on into your lungs, getting sunshine on your skin, looking up to the sky, looking in the trees, feeling and experiencing nature. And now there's research supporting why that is actually so useful and beneficial for the health of humans. So I really recommend you go and check out that episode. And I've got that linked in the show notes if you would like to click on that link. Making time for enjoyment and happiness is a really important part of the mindset piece. I have a happiness jar and that is where I write down things that have brought me happiness or joy in the day. When we've got SIBO, we can be incredibly internally fixated where we're just looking within and I really encourage you to look out. So my happiness jar can be around, oh, woohoo, I did a poo today. Yes, that's awesome because it is still awesome. (laughs) But then I also include other things like last night I got home, um, I've been away recently and my little doggy was at a kennel and I'm just loving being around him again. And we had this ridiculous game with each other for, I don't know, maybe an hour where we were just both on the floor and playing. And it's just so kind of primal where, you know, there was no technology. I wasn't sitting at a computer. I was just, it was just me and my dog playing a silly game with each other and both having so much enjoyment out of it. I was smiling and laughing, he was smiling and laughing and it was so much fun. So I write down things like that, like played a game with Basil and he was hysterical and I put that in my happiness jar. 
I love seeing blossom at the start of spring. I'm such a summer person. And so when I see the first blossoms, I'll take photos of it and I'll say, this blossom is sprung. And that goes in my happiness jar. It can be seeing the, the blue sky and the sunshine, you know, simple things. And I really encourage you to look outside of your gut and find the things that bring you joy in your life. And at the end of the year, I sit down with my happiness jar and I read it. And it's so lovely to see all of the things that brought me joy. And one thing that happens is when you read the note, I use post-it notes, various colors, because I like the brightness in my jar. And I'll read something and I'll let's say I read that note, played a crazy game with Basil and we were both laughing. I'm immediately transported back to that memory and that brings me joy. So I get those feel-good endorphins, my body feels positive. I'm sure if you were looking at my blood pressure, it would be reduced. So, you know, not only do I get the benefit of noting the positivity at the time, but I also get it again when I read over my notes. Something else that I think is really important in the return to health is giving back. I never used to be much of a person that gave back. I was pretty, it was all about me. And when I was diagnosed with SIBO and then I went through the treatment, one of the things that I decided was I wanted to help other people who were like me. I didn't want other people to suffer as long as I had suffered without getting answers as to what was going on. And that's why I developed The Healthy Gut. It's why I have produced this podcast and I give it to you for free because I'm passionate about giving back to the community. It's why through our social media channels, I'm you know forever responding to people's messages because I really want to give back. And in giving back to others, it has really helped me in my own journey. It helps me realize that I've learned so much but it also helps me know that I'm making a difference and that just makes me feel so great. But it also gives you perspective on what your life is like and what somebody else's life is like and that's really powerful. I also encourage you to have a spiritual practice. Now, I'm not a religious person, so I'm not praying to a God because I don't believe in God, but I am really spiritually connected to my body and the universe and the environment. I'm really passionate about tuning in and listening to my surroundings. And so whilst for me it's not sitting down and praying to God, but that could totally be what you do because that's your practice. That's what your life is about. But it's just around feeling connected, feeling connected with others, feeling connected with my environment, with the planet, with the seasons, with the changes in life. And I also incorporate meditation into this. And it's something that will continue to be something I work on. You know, I don't feel like I've mastered meditation yet. But that's fine. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be type A perfect at everything I do. Um, but, you know, what spiritual practice could you do? What could be part of your life? And then another thing about being the 360 degree view is education. The more empowered and educated we are about our health, our bodies, our conditions, the more informed we are and better equipped we are to make decisions. I know so much more about my body today so I can go into discussions with my practitioners and I can be educated and informed and it has taken the level of our conversations to such a deeper level. I, I treat my practitioners now as peers rather than superiors. I go into situations with them where I go in asking questions that I've thought about, I've researched, I've learnt about, and I would like to know their thoughts on it rather than that traditional patient-doctor relationship where they tell you everything and you just go, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So education, I think, is really powerful. There is one caveat to it, though, guys, and that is don't go into that research-obsessive mode hey, I know it well, that's where I went when I first got diagnosed. So using platforms like the Healthy Gut Podcast, the SIBO Coaching Program, or any of the other really credible online resources that are available, 
such as the IBS and SIBO SOS Summit. That's a great place to start. Um, Go and learn more about your condition, but do it in a manner that suits you today. So if you can only take in information in 15-minute segments, don't feel that you've got to sit down for an hour and listen to everything. If you're feeling really overwhelmed by your condition today, maybe today is not the right day for you to be trying to learn more about it. When you tune into how your body is feeling, it can really help you to schedule and time when these things are appropriate for you. When I was first diagnosed with SIBO, my type A personality wanted to go and learn everything there was. And I burnt myself out and completely overwhelmed myself with it. And then I had to step back and I really had to step back for a couple of months until I felt ready to dive into it again. So listen to your body, listen to your mind and what's suitable for you. Another component around uh, living with SIBO and one of my learnings has been around building a dream team of practitioners who I can lean on, who provide the support I need. Rather than just having one practitioner, I have a suite of people that I dip in and out of as required. And I don't let my location stop me. In the past I did, I was like, well, I live in Melbourne, Australia, so I can only see people from Melbourne, Australia or a close suburb to where I live. Whereas now, I would rather spend my hard-earned money on the right people. And if that means I have to Skype with them internationally, so be it. Because I recognize now that I'm investing in my future health. So I would rather go directly to the person that is leading their field than go to someone that only knows a little bit about the subject. And I can see that my investment in consultations with those practitioners has such a greater return on that investment. So yes, I might have to pay more to see them, but I get so much further in my journey by doing so than if I saw a practitioner that only knew a little bit, but I have to see them a lot. So here are the people that I have on my, t- on my dream team currently. I have got some naturopaths. So I've got a naturopath who I work with just for my general SIBO treatment. And I've got a naturopath who specializes in gut health and gut diversity. And I work with him on on rebuilding the diversity of my gut. I've got a naturopathic doctor in the US who gives me more specialized uh, medical recommendations and and not treatment because I'm in a different country so he can't treat me but he oversees my case and and works with my local practitioners and and gives me some really great insight into what uh, my condition is like and also what his experience has been with people like me. I have a psychologist who I work with uh, particularly around my approach to disordered eating and my the psychology around food and goal setting and that whole food and reward system. I'm such an emotional eater and we're helping to put in place systems where I don't need to reward with food. I can reward with other things. I've got my personal trainer who is there to support me with my movement. I have a physiotherapist who is helping treat me for my adhesions and we're doing visceral mobilization therapy. Now I have to fly to her. She's not near me. She's two states away. At least she's in the same country, but I have to make time to see her. So it's quite a reasonable expense to purchase the flights, the accommodation, the treatment. But what I recognize is that she is a really vital part of of treating an underlying cause and that I'm much rather I'd much rather invest my money in her to help prevent future relapses of SIBO than just keep dealing with SIBO. I have an osteopath who supports me with my back and I also go to a back rehab program and then in more recent times I've been seeing a podiatrist because I realized my feet were so badly out of alignment And our feet are the root of our structure. They're what help stand us up. So if our feet are out of alignment, 
that just knocks everything else out of alignment. There's a couple of other thing, people that I would like on my dream team. So I really want to do some work around my brain, given that I have had some quite significant brain injuries. And the wonderful interview I did with Kayla Sandberg-Lewis, and I really encourage you to go back and listen to that, really, really was an eye-opener for me around just the neural pathways and the messages coming from my brain to my gut and vice versa that I've probably got a bit of work to do around with that. So that will be a future person to add to my dream team. Another thing I've learnt, guys, over these last couple of years is that we know our bodies best. Yes, we can go to doctors who have had some amazing medical training, but they don't know what our body feels like because they're not living in it. Trust your symptoms and your instincts. Go with the people that feel right. I was recently asked by somebody who should they see. They had a couple of options for some practitioners and I said, well, who do you feel is right for you right now? And they were like, yeah, I'm going to see this doctor. So trust your instincts. If you feel things still aren't right in your body but you've got a doctor saying, no, you're fine, trust your instincts. Your body is telling you that for a reason. Likewise, if you're feeling great and you've got a doctor that's trying to push a whole heap of supplements on you, really question whether you need to do that. Listen to your body. Another thing I've learned over these years is the internal dialogue and my limiting self-beliefs. I used to have a pretty nasty internal dialogue, and at times I still can, so it's something I'm conscious of and I have to keep working on. But some of my internal dialogue would be around you're useless, you're worthless, you're stupid, you're fat, you're ugly, you're disgusting. Now, why is my body going to think anything other than those words if that's all I tell it? So now I talk about I'm strong, I'm smart, I'm powerful, I'm healthy. Because those words are going to take me there, even if I don't necessarily, even if I'm not necessarily there today, if I keep talking about how I'm healthy, I will get there. The brain doesn't know the difference between thoughts and reality. So tell it what you want your reality to be. If all you're focusing on is, oh, I'm so sick, I'm in so much pain, I feel so horrible, well, then the body's like, oh, okay, that's how we feel. Let's just keep giving you that. So try and focus on some of the things that aren't in the negative zone. I've also talked about how I've approached spending. And, you know, I'm definitely not flush with cash. I don't have a bottomless pit of money to just spend on all of the amazing treatments that are in the world. I really have to prioritize my spending. I wish I was wealthy and I could just spend whatever I wanted to, but I'm not that person. I'm self-employed. So guys, there have been times when I'm literally like, I don't even know how I'm buying dinner tonight. But what I've done is I am prioritizing my spending. I'm putting my money and investing it. Notice my language. It's an investment into my future health. I'm not wasting my money on distractions. So here's where I spend my money now, guys. I spend it on treatment. I spend it on really good quality food because I know my food is such an important uh, step towards health. And I spend it on the things that make me happy. I don't spend it on useless, pointless activities. I'm really quite strict with where I spend my money now. And then finally, I really look at what positives I can take from this experience. Now, when I was in the dark depths of SIBO before I even knew what it was, I didn't feel very positive at all. I felt very angry and negative. But today I am actually so incredibly grateful that I have SIBO and that I now know what it is because SIBO has changed my life in almost every way. And so as weird as it might sound, I am so grateful for SIBO because it was the wake-up call I needed. I needed to change my life. I needed to make the modifications because my body was screaming at me and saying, we cannot continue to go on like this. And yeah, 
I've relapsed with SIBO and I'm waiting to see if I still have SIBO after the elemental diet. But I am so much healthier and happier than I was three years ago. I've learnt to listen to my body. I've learnt to tune in and hear the symptoms my body gives me. And I approach them with interest and intrigue and excitement and curiosity. Whereas in the past, I just approached them with fear and hatred. Another thing I've that has been positive out of this, this experience for me is that I have felt compelled to give back to the SIBO community. And I am so proud that I have been able to help hundreds of thousands of people from around the world. And that's only happened because I was told I had SIBO. And so I'm really grateful for that SIBO diagnosis because I have had a positive impact on other people. You, who is listening. (laughs) And ultimately, I am a better person today because I am a sum of all of my experiences, the good, the bad and the ugly. I am healthy. I am strong. I am educated. I am interested I am powerful and I can make a difference to my life. I am not stuck or victim to my health or my poor health anymore. I really encourage you to think about what positives you can take out of this experience. What can you be grateful for? Even if it's something tiny, just start there. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode, guys. I really wanted to share the lessons I've experienced over the last couple of years of dealing with SIBO. And I look forward to seeing what new lessons I will learn over the coming years as well. As this is one of the last episodes for season two, don't forget that there is a survey that you can complete where you get to tell me what you would like to see in season three. I would absolutely love to hear from you. So head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast. You'll see a pop up and you can fill in this survey. It literally just takes a couple of minutes to do. And uh, you can tell me what you want out of season three in the Healthy Gut podcast. And don't forget to come and say hi on Facebook and Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest and Google+. We are all over the place and we absolutely love hearing from you. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Red Lemon Productions for the production and original music score of this podcast. To find out more about their services, head to redlemonproductions.com. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening.